And then I go, I go home, I take my kids, I take them to the side, I give them each $10. I said, I hope you learned your lesson today. Uh, and I said, and this is for, and I said, thank you for pooping in the pool. <laughs> so, so in the in the story, my kids pooped in the pool. Yeah, right? Right? right. And it's funny because some guy saw me do that. Some Iranian, older Iranian guy who was upset about my jokes about Trump. Right. He then in his email to me about how upset he was about my jokes about Trump. He goes, and then you ended by encouraging kids to poop in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, I can't believe you made your kids poop in the pool. That's a disgrace to our community. <laughs> gentlemen my name is Taima Skafari and welcome to the lounge podcast I should probably say lounge poddan and for you guys who are wondering why I'm speaking English this time it's not because I have gone crazy it's because we have an international guest this time I'm really really psyched to present Maz Jubrani is um, is a comedian I've been following for years and uh, he's on a world tour and he swung by Sweden this time and uh, I got a chance to sit down with him and with him he had a really really funny colleague and comedian friend and actor named Bill Dawes for you guys who don't know Maz Jubrani he is an actor he's a comedian he's on a world tour at the moment and also so he has a Netflix special out if you haven't seen it it's called Maz Jobrani Immigrant so go look that up it's really funny so I was really interested in uh, knowing how life is as a comedian as an international comedian how did they start up how did they go from regular jobs to starting up as an actor as a comedian we talk a lot about comedy in general how to set up jokes what is funny what is not funny how do they come up with material? And of course, we round everything up uh, with a little bit of political talk and, and a little bit about Trump. Anyway, I'm not going to keep you waiting anymore. Let's start this episode. And uh, here they come, Maz Jobrani and Bill Dawes. And uh, yes, hello everybody and welcome to Lounge, the Lounge podcast, let's say, in English. Ooh, yeah. Lounge. lounge Podden, can you say after me? Lounge no. Podden. Lounge Podden. <laughs> and we have two guests here, Bill Dawes and Maz Jibrani. Yeah. Welcome. Bill Dawes and Maz. <laughs> Bill, Maz and Dawes. And <laughs> Thanks, Bill, man. Yeah, and uh, you have both stolen a part of my name. My name is Ty Maz and you have stolen like the last ah, part of my yeah, name. Yeah, Maz. Maz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's short for Maziar, right? Maziar, yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you that. Persian or what are you? You're yeah, I'm Persian. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm uh, well. I'm Swedish as well, but Thai Maz, Thai Maz, Thai Maz. Yes, but the Persians true. pronounce it Thai Maz or Thai Maz. Thai Maz. Thai Maz. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. But it's uh, actually Azeri from the northern part. Azeri. My yeah. dad was from northern Iran. He's yeah. from uh, ta- Tabriz. Yeah, mine too. There you go. Kifin yach chide. You know what I mean? Oh, there you go. I know. I don't know. That's it. We're done. I know. I know a little bit. And uh, Bill, where are you from? Uh, Virginia, originally in the States. It sounds so boring now. Right. No, it, <laughs> it really doesn't. That's the most uh, interesting part for me. I, I don't know a lot oh, about it. Oh, sounds exotic to you, Virginia. Yeah. Don't, let me just tell you, don't go to Virginia. Yeah. No. It's very rednecky. Yeah, you heard from your uh, stand-up just now. <laughs> yeah. And thank you guys both for a really good uh, show. We were just on um, on the on the on the set where you uh, had this um, amazing show, uh, both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank and you. how is it being in Sweden? It's not the first time for you, Mas, right? I love it. I've done Stockholm. I've done Sweden for. I started the first time I did Sweden was in 2008. All right. I came to Stockholm, did the China Theater. I loved it. I love your audiences because they're very cosmopolitan, very mixed, right. um, very uh, politically aware, very liberal, and that's all up my alley. So when people ask me about doing stand-up, they go, what's your favorite place to do stand-up in the world? I always say Washington, D.C. is my favorite. Okay, And then Sweden would be right there at either two or three. I mean, I love St- Stockholm in particular. And so I've come here several times, and actually I shot my special, uh, one of my specials called I Come in Peace. I shot that in 2012 in Stockholm. So I come to Stockholm pretty often now. I love it. I love Stockholm. Yeah. We love to have you here. And you're going to do another show soon. And for you guys who haven't booked a ticket uh, yet, uh, this show is going to air on Thursday. And uh, then you have two more shows on Saturday, right? Yeah, yeah. so we're on a tour right now. Right. So Bill and I know each other from Los Angeles. And uh, so Bill, one of the times I was in Stockholm, Bill happened to be in Stockholm. 
And he said, can I get on the show, right? Yeah. And remember that was the China Theater. The China Theater. Yeah. That's and, right. And what did you think of the show when you did it? It was great. I think that was one, one of the first theaters I did, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So so he got a taste of this audience. And so when he saw me coming back, he goes, hey, can I come out with you on this tour? I said, let's do it. So he's a buddy. So we are doing, basically, we're doing 11 shows in... Um, eight cities over nine nights. So every night we go to a new city. So we started in London, then we went Paris, Copenhagen, tonight was Stockholm, tomorrow would be Gothenburg, um, then it's uh, um, Oslo, Amsterdam, Stockholm again, Rotterdam, and then we fly back. Now I don't know when this is airing, so when I say tonight, that means April 9th, tonight, Tuesday. So I don't know when you're airing this. Thursday, the 11th. So when you yeah. air Thursday the 11th, yeah. we'll be in Oslo that night. And then we'll be back in Stockholm that Saturday. So right. for those guys who haven't booked their tickets, hopefully there are some still left them. I think Stockholm sold out, but they released like, I don't know, 10 tickets for, there's two shows. They released 10 tickets for each show. Right. So maybe it'll still be sold out, but whatever, you know, you know, follow us on uh, on social and come <laughs> see it next time. Get your tickets yeah. early. Right. Give out your handles right now. And At Maz Jobrani, M-A-Z-J-O-B-R-A-N-I. At Bill Dawes, B-I-L-L-D-A-W-E-S. Super. And uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm super happy to have you both on. I've, uh, I've, obviously, I know you a little bit from before, Moz, uh, not personally, but I've been following you uh, a long time. Yeah. And uh, I think the first time I saw you was um, this act where you were, um, you were like the, the kind pers- uh, the kind one in the <laughs> Middle East where you were a Persian cat. Oh, uh, oh, oh, the stand-up of, are you talking about my stand-up? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the joke I, I, I used you. to do a joke, yeah, so there was a tour I did years ago called the Axis of Evil Comedy Tour. That was in 2007. And one of the jokes I had on that back then, um, I was newer to stand-up, and I, one of the jokes I did was how Iranians like to say they're Persian because it just sounds nicer and friendlier. <laughs> right. And they would say, I'm Persian, you right. know, like me. I'm Persian like the cat. Meow. <laughs> so that became this kind of yeah. uh, joke that a lot of people liked, and they started passing it around. And I don't know how old you are, but I was in 2007. I started to see the rise of YouTube. And it was before a lot of the social media pages had started. So what would happen is if people liked a clip of anyone's stand-up or whatever, they would take that clip and they would send the YouTube link to their email list. Right. So you would get an email and you would see a hundred other people's emails on there. And at the end it would say, you know, let's say Tamoz, let's say you found something, right? And we would say, you would say, um, oh, check out this guy. And there's, everyone's emails are on there, right. and then the clips there. So you'd watch it. So that Persian like the cat clip started circulating, and several times people would send me the same clip of myself, and I saw it. I go, oh my god, this is people are starting to discover me, and it was because of the rise of YouTube, I think, that helped a lot of comedians get to become known. And so that was one of the first ones that I had that actually kind of went viral. So that was that was the original one that I had. Yeah. All right. So yeah. that was one of the questions when you uh, when you realized that you had made it and what is actually like a successful <laughs> comedian. When do you know? Because you can be out of date anytime. Is that right, Bill? When do you know when you've made it? Well, I definitely know I haven't made it. <laughs> but I also feel like people, particularly in Hollywood, they they I feel like no one feels like they made it. Everyone's always like. Well, yeah, I'm I'm doing these movies, but now I need an Oscar. I want an Oscar. Why I want to, like every, there's always another level that they want to get to. There is a pressure. As a matter of fact, uh, even Will Smith now has a YouTube channel going. So you got to think about that. I mean, Will Smith is one of the biggest movie stars in the world, but he realized YouTube is next, so he started his own YouTube channel, and I guess he's got millions and millions of followers. But you're right. I think for me, somebody asked me one time, what's you know, when do you know you made it? And, and in all honesty, because I come from a immigrant background and my parents really were pushing against me doing this, it took me several years to come back around and convince my parents and myself that I should do this. Right. So I told this person years ago, I said, the moment I started doing this, I made it. Right. That was mm. for me success. I said, everything else has been icing on the cake. So whether it's a big movie I've done or whether it's a Netflix special or whether it's performing... I got to, I got a chance to perform at the White House. Wow! Um, you know I got a chance to perform in front of the King of Jordan. Uh, you know touring like this and being in all these theaters at the Kennedy Center. There's some really 
amazing stuff that I've done that I don't say it in a uh, in a way of like showing off, but rather, wow, look at what happens when you do what you want to do. Yeah. And sometimes you just put it in the world. We were talking about this earlier. There's a you know just like the, this this thing called the secret, where it's like when you manifest it and you put it out there, it happens. And for me, it was just like let me just do it. If you if you had asked me 20 years ago when I first started doing stand up comedy, if you said what do you think you're going to be doing 20 years from now, I would not have been able to say any of the stuff. You know, I went to uh, a school called UC Berkeley, which is a big school out in in California. And a couple of years ago, they asked me to do the to do the commencement speech for the university, and I'm there, and I'm thinking to myself, "Wow, there's all these Nobel laureates, uh, scientists, inventors, all these people that have gone from here, and for whatever reason, the world just came together in a way." That was when my I think my Netflix special no, it hadn't come out yet, but I was doing a lot of stuff, and I think the the things of like anti-immigrant sentiment was out there, so a lot of the kids wanted me to be the speaker. And I was like, how did this come together? I have no idea. I just was doing me, and then they picked me, and they put me in there, and I got to give this speech in front of like 45,000 people. Wow, that's amazing. It was amazing. And I so again, what it, when am I successful? When I started doing this. Basically, that's part of the question, but I mean, how do you know when you can start living? What did you do before you lived? Well, on- I, yeah, so I, when I first started doing this, now that's what I'm saying, like, to me, it was success. So I, at the time, I was working as an assistant in an advertising agency. Okay. So I was the guy who would answer the phones or get the coffee or type the paper. You know, somebody would say, type this and deliver this. Great, I'm the guy. Right. And so at the time, I was dating this girl who then I ended up marrying, and she was a lawyer at the time, and she came from a very different world. She came from the world of being a lawyer, being successful, being somebody who's you know, got a great income, and she didn't understand what I was doing. And she would ask me, she goes, how do you plan to make a living doing this? And I told her, I said, listen, because it was the first woman I'd ever met where I thought, you know, I would want to marry her. And I told her, I said, look, if we end up getting married at some point in our lives, I said, the amount of of passion I have for stand-up right now, if I had to get a job at, let's say, Starbucks just so that I can can get us health insurance and I can still do my stand-up at night, I'll do it. So I told her right there, I said, this is my thing. And she had no idea. She's like, you're an assistant in an advertising agency. Like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I said, this is what I'm doing. I said, I, I just, and I didn't, at that point I wasn't like, oh, wait, one day you'll see, I'll be successful. Make No, I didn't know. And Bill knows when we first start out at the comedy clubs in, in Los Angeles, they, they either pay you like $15 to do 15 minutes or they pay you, uh, sometimes they don't pay you at all. Like you go to coffee shops and you do a show and they go, you get a free coffee. <laughs> yeah. We used to do a place that was called um, Highland Grounds or something like that. You pay, you pay five bucks. You would pay. You pay five bucks. Mm-hmm. They give you a cup of coffee and three minutes on stage. All right. So you really got to love it, right? I have friends who are doctors who are great. They love it. I love this. So for me, this was my passion. And so I just kept doing it. And then what would happen is being in L.A., you get a commercial or something. Commercials pay pretty good money. Oh, I made a little bit of money. Then you get like a, a, a one episode on a TV show. Then you get something else, something else. And then eventually it starts adding up. And then for me, really, around the time the Access to Evil happened and that clip of mine started circulating, I realized, oh, wow, I can actually go out and make money doing stand-up. Right. And then suddenly, whereas when I first started, my acting gigs were paying for my stand-up work, my stand-up work suddenly started paying for my acting work. Mm-hmm. Right. That's when I, oh, I hello. Sure, perfect, thank you. <laughs> the burgers have been delivered, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. Burgers have we arrived. We just had burgers. This is life on the road. <laughs> Luckily, there's a spit screen in front of the mics. Fantastic. For you who are listening to this, we're recording this at uh, in American time zone, basically, right? 11 at night. No, it's not. It's, it's, this is a Stockholm time zone. I mean, it's, it's daytime. <laughs> and, and, but, no, but, yeah. well, you know, let the people know. We had the show, right? You guys yeah, came. Yeah, And then let's, 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 Beautiful. Let's, let's do it after. Bill, uh, you were talking a little bit about uh, how life is in Hollywood. How is life in Hollywood, especially for for comedians? Are there are you like separate from the? Uh, I mean, basically, you're uh, actors as well. Yeah. Uh, but do you feel separated from the actors in some kind of way? Are are they more fancy than you guys, or are they're you definitely more fancy than <laughs> us? Do they <laughs> feel like that? I know. I, th- I think. I think actors. This is going to sound really name droppy, but I remember I, I was dating. Uh, uh, 
this is when I was I first moved to LA. I started dating a model because that's what you do when you first move to LA. You date some skinny model who loves coke, and then um, and she was she. Uh, this sounds so stupid, but she she was friends with Leonardo DiCaprio, and she was always flirting with him to make me feel like a piece of shit. And uh, and she was like, oh yeah, I'm dating a guy. He's a comic. And he's like, oh my god, he's a stand up comic. Ugh, those. That's so much talent right there. I can't imagine how anyone could do that. So I'm always amazed how many actors are like so blown away by stand-up comedy. Like I can actually imagine. I talked to my uh, friend who is here uh, with us in the studio. I'm so impressed every time I go to to a stand-up comedy show. Partly because it feels like you're doing it, like you're just winging it, but you, I know you're not. Uh, yeah. And also when you talk to all the audiences uh, before the show and after the show, like just coming up with new stuff. That's I mean I'm so amazed every time. Obviously that's your daytime job or nighttime yeah, job. Yeah. Well, I'm usually amazed if something works if I try it for the first time like, oh wow <laughs> yeah and something I was impressed by uh, as well before we started out recording here I heard you two talking about how you could make the next show better just small small details that yeah. you're talking about and that's amazing I mean yeah. even this late at night that you're trying to you know well yeah I, I really respect and, and, uh, and admire Maz I have for a long time so when he gives me notes I'm like hey I'll listen there are a lot of comics who are like hey don't tell me don't tell me I do my, you know, a lot of comics are really resistant to, to feedback for some reason. I don't are know successful why. successful comedians, are they like that? Some of them. Can some you of them afford are. not to, I mean, Oh, I, I take any idea I hear and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take it and get credit for it. If it works, it's all mine. You know, the thing about comedy, what you were talking about the actors and stuff, I think, I think within the business, you're right, Bill. I think a lot of actors want, you know, they, they will maybe be, um, not envious, but like they're they 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 like comedians, like like real 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 actors like comedians. The same way where as comedians, we'll sit there and watch an acting job and go, "Wow, that guy!" Like you know that you know Christian Bale really committed to that. Like you just wow, you know. So there's definitely a respect back and forth. Um, I think the the business side or the art of it, it feels like there is a little bit of a hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a movie star, right. then the business, meaning like the agents and managers and all that stuff, they're like, oh my God, that guy can open up a movie, he's a box office star. But they don't necessarily go, these people that are agents and managers or whatever and producers, they're not necessarily in the comedy clubs watching all the co comedians. I mean, they'll right. see like the, you know, if it's a hot place to go or if it's a hot comedian, they may show up and watch. But for the most part, they're not in the trenches watching some amazing comedians. And we all know, like there's all these people that you're seeing, they're going, wow, why hasn't this guy been discovered? Yeah, It's just because he's doing his thing right. and he's not going, or she, and they're not going the route of, I'm trying to make it as a movie star, whatever, whatever. I'm a, I'm a performer, but I'm a writer. I have something to say. Right. Um, so there is a hierarchy. And also if you think about it with stand-up comedy, we're very accessible. You can come to a comedy club and hang out backstage and you'll run into Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock or T Kevin Hart, some of the, biggest names in comedy have to walk through the hallway to get there. Whereas if you're a rock star, nobody sees you. You come in from the back, you have security, they put you on stage, you say goodbye, you're gone. Or if you're a movie star even, like if you're on a set, no one's coming to you. And you know, So there's definitely some of that stuff going on in terms of somebody was saying like it's stand-up comedy is is uh, the, the least respected performance art form. Mm -hmm. It's not Broadway. It's none of that stuff. But it is. But you said it ain't easy. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't. And, and some people that want to do it. A lot of times, people come to me. They go, "I want to be a comedian." I go, "Okay, that's great. Uh, get on stage five to ten times a week and do that <sighs> for ten years, and you'll start getting pretty good at it." Right. And that's really what it is. Yeah. You know, Bill. Uh, obviously, I know a little bit um, uh, about uh, Mars. Tell me a little bit about your stuff. So, well, I, I came into it <coughs> as an actor. I, I went to graduate school for for acting in New York at NYU, and so all I ever wanted to do was like cry and scream and <laughs> and do like Christian Bale stuff. So that's that's. Was it right after high school in Virginia? Uh, no, I went to I went to Princeton University okay. as an engineer for right. college. I wasn't very good at it, but then I was so I, I applied to grad school. Yeah, this is a give time for Maz to eat. Yeah, this is yeah. I'm eating. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you know, my parents are very like you know, kind of like low middle class, and and they were like, oh wow, he's going to be an engineer from Princeton. And then I I I went to jobs for Wall Street. I applied to jobs for Wall Street. I just remember I was in the middle of an uh, an interview and on Wall Street and. 
They said, why do you want to be on Wall Street? And I started doing a packaged answer that someone had told me. In the middle of it, I, I just said, ah, man, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. In the middle of the interview? In the middle of the interview. I, I had a briefcase. Like, my dad bought me a briefcase wow. for these interviews. That's hilarious. It was, it was in Manhattan. <laughs> I'd gone up from, from Jersey. Yeah. And uh, and I just remember I, I, I walked out of Wall Street. I walked down to Battery Park City, and there was a river. And I just threw the brief, briefcase in the river. What was in the briefcase? It was just like papers and resume and all that crap. And I just threw it in. You um, just quit right there. Just, I just said, I'm not going to do this. This it sounds a, like a movie. Yeah, it was very, it was very <laughs> dramatic. And I littered. Um, very but, Jerry Maguire. <laughs> but so, I, yeah, then I got into NYU grad school, which is a very difficult grad school. And all I wanted to do was just kind of be a, be a really dramatic method actor. So I had no idea that I wanted to do comedy. But I used to be a professional break dancer. And in my crew, I was the goofy guy who would do like impersonations of Mark Wahlberg and Vanilla Ice. And so I was kind of like a clown. When you say professional break dancer, you got paid to break yeah, dance? I got paid. I was a go-go dancer in New York when I was what? in grad school. Yeah. Is that the ones where you dance and dudes are like putting tips? I was like, <laughs> well, there were gay nights sometimes. Right. Uh, You're the original Magic Mike. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Oh, You're yeah. Magic Bill. I got Magic. I got, I got, By yeah. the way, do you still have panties on? Huh? Oh, they're not real. They're, they're, it's just like a strap. All right, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah. For those who who haven't seen the show, I won't. <laughs> I won't give anything away for maybe yeah, those who are is. coming out I on just, Saturday. I just put like a, a oh, strap right. and I <laughs> wrap around my waist. All right. It looked like he had panties on during so when the I, show. When I started, I, I, my my big inspirations were probably like early on were like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, just physical. And I I, w I was going to go to clown school, and I wanted to join the circus. All right. And do all that crap. Um, but uh, so. So then, you know, one of my early influences in comedy was probably Dan Cook because he was a guy who's doing a lot of physical comedy. And I was like, oh, wow. So friends of mine would constantly go, oh, you should check this guy out. He reminds me of you when you're like drunk at parties and shit. Right. So, and that was real, like, we'd, you know, I'd go to the beach and I would be the guy who would do flips and land on a girl's towel and be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, I was just the, go the goofy <laughs> pratfall guy. Right. So, um, so when I started doing phys uh, stand up, uh, I got really drunk one night and I don't know what I was doing. I was like probably kicking a lot and jumping on stage and doing all this dumb stuff. And it took me, and of course I bombed. It took me a while to go, like, okay, wait, this isn't really, this isn't really the right. <laughs> so I had to kind of like transition out of just doing physical comedy and into like the spoken word and writing a joke. And it took, took me a while to kind of figure that out. I'm still figuring that out. Where but were I, you, where were you when you first, was it a coffee shop, a comedy club? Where'd you perform? My first stand-up gig was in New York City. It was a place called Surf Reality, which doesn't exist. It was like a Lower East Side. Same thing. It was like you put your name in a hat. Right. You buy, you know, it's like seven bucks to buy your drink, and then you put your name, and they, you wait, and they, then you have three minutes. And I just remember I just bombed, but I got one laugh, and I think that one laugh was enough for me. Like, it was two things. One was like, okay, I can get a laugh. I can literally get a laugh. Right. And and two, I don't want to bomb again. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I did like an Eminem thing. I was in the mirror with a microphone, like, uh, like practicing. <laughs> but you went for the positive anyway. You you didn't think of quitting. I mean, no, it's so weird because I look back now. I go, if it was me now, right. like where my mind is now, right. what I was going through, I I, I would have quit in a heartbeat. Because do you it's think that terrible. is a, that is an age thing? I I feel yeah. myself becoming. I mean, m more and more. Um, uh, I'm uh, oh, more yeah. and more afraid to to challenge myself all the time. That's why I try to do it all the time. But as a comedian. Do you try new things that you haven't like, and, and that's yeah. also interesting. Branding. W what would you say your your comedian brand is? I, I don't know, and I think that's also something that I've kind of I've kind of struggled with because because I used to do a lot of urban shows, and urban shows is kind of code for for black shows. Okay. So I'd be like the goofy white guy, and I would literally break down. I would do the worm on <laughs> stage, and I would break dance. I would do all you know. I, I would do a lot of stuff like that, and. Um, and then I would just do like really, I guess, I don't know, hacky, maybe a little bit hacky, where I would just say jokes that I know would land really hard in a black audience. Right. You know, I, I'd go on stage as a, as a pale white guy. And right. yeah, and so I look like I'm like, what's going on? They play music and I start like break dancing. I go up, there's a black woman in the front row and I start like motorboating her and they're like, oh, okay. this guy's crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of like how I started. And then, yeah. and it took, a, it took a few years to realize like, okay, that's, if that's what you want to do, I think Jamie Masada, the owner of the Laugh Factory in LA, was like, "Hey, if that's what you want to do, you can be that guy. Right. But if you want to actually have a career in this and be a good comic, you should actually 
he, he would make me do things like you have to sit on you have to sit on a, on a stool and do your whole act. It's like uh, the Karate That's Kid. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot like the Karate Kid. And then he would make me one time he made me go up and as a Russian in a Russian accent for a whole set, just like make a character. And I did that for a month at the Hollywood Laugh Factory. And then another comic said, you better stop doing that. He's going to make you do that forever. Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. The, pro- the problem with characters <laughs> is I used to do I used to do silly character once in a while when it was late night at the, the comedy store. I would do this, uh, I would do a, a gay German guy. <laughs> and his name was Dusseldorf. And the whole thing was like, and his whole thing was, it was silly because it wasn't even that great of an accent, but it was, you know, Jerry Seinfeld used to say, you know, Jerry Seinfeld's thing is like, what's up with that? You know who Jerry Seinfeld is? <laughs> yeah. So his whole punchline is always like, you know, the, when if you want to do a bad impression of Jerry Seinfeld, you would do, you know, French fries in Sweden. What's up with that? It's always like, what's up with that? <laughs> what's, what's up with that? <laughs> right. So then this Dusseldorf character would be like, you know, it is so nice to be here today and they've got cameras and speakers. What's up with that? <laughs> and it was just silly. And that would still kill, by the way. <laughs> Dude, late night, people were laughing. And I, and exactly what you just said, you, the, the the fear that if this guy does too good, does you know, he's, he's going <laughs> to yeah. take over. Right. And the other problem becomes is you're hiding behind a character. So the question becomes, because stand-up comedy, the longer you do it, the person you are off stage gets closer to the person you are on stage. Mm, so the more you do a character, the more you're avoiding the basically what would be considered oh, go to the, I'm good, I'm good to the fourth. Don't worry. <laughs> what would be considered almost like therapy. You're doing therapy to get to who you are. And so the longer you do it, the closer you get to who you are. But if but but if if your character is really funny and really good. Well, now it's all about this character's point of view. And sometimes you hide behind that character's point of view. Yeah. But if you're able to go, like Bill was saying, like what you were talking about, Bill, when you're doing the black comedy room mm-hmm. and you're doing material for them. I used to do a lot of shows in Latino, like Mexican rooms, and I would do a lot of, and it was bars. And I used to do a lot of jokes that were but people in bars wanted to hear. So it was like, you know, who likes boobs? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And, and I realized quickly, I go, oh, wait, I am letting the audience dictate what I want to do. So what you become is, and there's a lot of comedians who, who end up unfortunately down this path, you become someone without a point of view, mm-hmm. you become someone who's not unique, you become someone who, if people are casting a movie, they really don't know what to think of you, like they don't know what ca- what part you would play. Whereas there's parts now where people specifically will hit me up, hey, I thought of you, I had this part, I thought you'd be great. Right. I've, that's how they define me in their minds. Now, for me, as an Iranian American, I go a step further because sometimes people define me as like, oh, I have this part. He's a Middle Eastern guy. I thought of you. I go, well, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered. But think of me when you think of a guy who's yeah. also maybe whatever, a dad, or uh, who's frustrated with something, you know. Right. So basically, the idea is you go on stage to find your voice. And that's why you have to go on stage. You got to talk about stuff. Like Bill just said, you go through so many nights of spots in front of five or six people on a Tuesday. No one's in the crowd. Those are some of the best nights because you go, I got nothing to lose. I have no one to impress. So you know what I'm going to do tonight? I'm going to go on stage. I'm going to talk about the um, whatever, the, I don't know, the. Like something new? Something new or something that, that something that that you've experienced that's been on your mind. Let's say Let's say you had this horrible trip and you whatever got pulled over at uh you know whatever the 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 you got to the airport the ticket wasn't there and this and this and that whatever let's just say and you're like oh my god what a disaster well there's something that's on your mind but you haven't really thought about the jokes about of it yet but but a night when it's not that packed unless you get dumped by your girlfriend the night when it's not packed is a great night to talk about it oh my yeah. god guys let me be honest with you there's only five of us here why am i going to try and do stupid jokes why am i going to do the worm Right. <laughs> why am I gonna Why am I gonna break dance Break dance for you? Right. Can I tell you what's really going on in my life? And they usually go, Yeah, yeah. You go, This bitch just dumped me. Yeah. <laughs> and right away they're like, Oh, this is great. It's right. raw. It's there. Right. Some of the best sets I've had have been just got an argument with my wife. Come on stage. Yeah. And I just go. Yeah. Or the other, I did some silly riff one time on you know Lionel Richie. You know, right? Oh, right. Nine, nine. I was in the I was in the kitchen one night at the at the comedy store talking to somebody. Maybe it's Joe Diaz or somebody. For some reason, we start talking about Lionel Richie, and I've, I have this theory that Lionel Richie is a bad motherfucker. Like he is badass, and people that don't believe me, they go, "Oh, get the hell out!" I go, "Go see him in concert. You'll realize how many songs 
He was with the Commodores, then he had his own. And I ended up one time just accidentally, I was at some event, and they had their, the, the, the guest performer was Lionel Richie. Oh, wow. And at the time, my wife had not come with me, and she was on the phone, and, and she goes, when are you coming home? I go, I go, I'm at this event right now. Lionel Richie's going to perform. I go, listen, uh, I'll be home in about, I'm going to watch like two or three songs. I'll be home in about 20 minutes. Hour and a half later, I'm like, he wrote that? <laughs> and it was the most amazing thing. So I'm in the comedy store one night talking to somebody, and we're both talking about, like, Lionel Richie's a bad motherfucker. I go, and then he did this, and then he's like, yeah, he did that, did that. So we're just going off on how much we love Lionel Richie. And then, and then because at the comedy store or Laugh Factory in LA, they do what's called continuous comedy. All right. So you're not the headliner doing an hour. Everyone, it's a, it's like five or six comedians each doing 15, 15, 15, 15. All right. So you may show up, you know, half an hour early. So you're hanging in the back, and someone's on stage, and you're not sitting there watching them. You're just talking to your buddies. And then they'll come over and they'll say, uh, they'll say, hey, you're on. So I remember I was talking about Ron right, right, Richie, this, that, the other, and someone's like, you're on. And then I was like, what? Okay. And then I go, and then they go, and, and then the comedian introduces the next comedian. So they go, all right, give it up for Maz, you're running. I go on stage. Lionel Richie is on my mind. So my first five minutes, I'm up. First thing I go up there, I go, "Hey, what's up?" All night long, and people don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, "You guys don't know this, but Lionel Richie's a bad motherfucker." And I started talking about it, and it was this amazing set, and the audience was laughing, and it was just because it was sincere. Right. Yeah. You understand what I'm right. saying? Absolutely. So the opposite is what you just said, and we still fall. We still fall victim to this, even when you're in it 20 years, you'll get hired to do an event. Right. What's called a corporate event. Pepsi's having their big corporate thing. They want you to do 20 minutes. They don't want you to do any political material, no dirty material, no this, no this, no that. So you're up there, you're like, oh shit. <laughs> so now I gotta do jokes that Pepsi people will like. So you're up there, you're like, you know, <laughs> let's start out by saying, fuck Coke. Coca-Cola <laughs> is the worst product in the world. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, wow, it's I got to do another hour after that. <laughs> Don't but get me started on Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Comedy is really an interesting art form in that way that, I mean, you don't really have a school to go to from the beginning. Yeah. And even if you do If you went have, to school, it's going to be shitty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you go there, it's conventional and you're in some kind of weird lines where you have to be. And that's not a comedian, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, you, you talked a little bit about like Mr. Miyagi or, or being like karate kid and taking advice. Well, there, so. There's a couple, Jamie Masada who, I mean, was kind of my mentor and he was the one who, when I was a, a, a year in, kind of passed me at the Laugh Factory in LA and New York. And he, as Maz knows, he just takes you on comics and just berates them and tells them. But he told me a lot and sometimes I'm like, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And then later I go like, oh, I get it. One of the things he told me is, he's like, you gotta get rid of your addiction to kill. What is that? Uh, t to kill on stage, just to like smash, because like, I would have sets where I was huge, huge laughs and smash. I'd break dance and, and rip my pants off and all sorts of stuff. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so he goes, you got to just get rid of that addiction to kill because that's not really what you want to do. You want to be vulnerable and you want to express your express your truth. And it is. It, it's. And I, I had this conversation with someone recently because I just moved my daughter into Berkeley. And we were at Target or moving her in and there's stuff with her mom. And so I, it was a really intense time and I came back on stage at the Hollywood Laugh Factory and I just did the set about vegans, kind of what I, mostly what I did tonight. Right. And my friend was like, wait, you were just up there with your daughter. You were shopping with her at Target. Why don't you talk about that? And I was kind of like, well, look, I just got back. I'm following Tony Rock on a packed show at the Laugh Factory. I'm not going to just wing it and hope that people find my point of view about. Now I will say this, and I'm going to blow up Maz's spot here. Maz is one of the few people, I would say, you and uh, and Godfrey more than anyone I know. And now you're working on a special, different thing. But like you've gone up there, I've seen you maybe do like ten sets in a row that were completely different, where you were really just. I was like, wait. Is he just not get, there? There are people who process their thoughts in stand-up comedy form, right? And like Godfrey, I, I opened for him. I don't know if you know who he is, but he, uh, but he, he came in one time in Philadelphia. He's like, "Oh man, fucking Macklemore! I hate that guy. He's ruined hip hop. He's a piece of shit." So, <laughs> the DJ came up to me and he goes, "He goes, what music should I, should I bring Godfrey up to?" I said, "Bring Macklemore. You got to bring him up with Macklemore." So he goes on stage. <laughs> 
and he hears this the song. He goes, "Wait, what, what's the song?" No, it's like Macklemore. He's like, "Oh, this motherfucker! He want a half hour on Macklemore, murdered." And I and I don't feel like I have that. There there have been times there, I, I was in jail once for hopping a turnstile in New York, and I was in like the roughest jail in New York City. Right. What is a uh, turnstile? It turns out it's a subway turnstile. Oh, all right, all right, all right. And I was on like a, a date. I I was wearing a suit. Right. And I went to like. Do you go to jail for that? If if you don't have your ID, yeah. Wow. So um, right. they put me in in cent- in Bedside, like central booking in the middle. So everyone there is on their way to Rikers Island and Alcatraz or murders and, and rapists. You had a suit on. I had a suit on. I think <laughs> I had a lip gloss. I was on a date. Was it that day when you throw away the briefcase? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, it was all the same day. It's a very but long I, day. I'd been doing, doing stand up at that point. So I, w- I went to, uh, so I was there for 26 hours. Oh, and yeah. I remember th- when I met my lawyer after 26 hours, I go, I go, can you get me on the dock? I go, I got a set. And a, and a couple hours, and he goes, "Oh, sure, you know." So they let me out. They were like, "The judge, was like, this is stupid. Let this guy go." Right. So I got in the subway, went straight on stage at the uh, Times Square Laugh Factory. Used to be there, um, and I talked about it. I talked about all my thoughts about being in jail, and it killed. And I was like, "Wow, I got this great bit." Then a week later, I was like, "I'll do that bit again," and it wasn't the same because it wasn't fresh. And now I'm telling a story that feels like. Is packaged, and I always talk about this the idea of like Clockwork Orange, right? Which is like an orange is an organic fruit right. of life, and then you try to mechanize it. And whenever you try to mechanize something that's completely organic and fresh, eventually it's going to become stale. Right? Y- you know what I mean? So it's yeah, hard. Yeah, it's yeah. always hard to imbue the same strong point of view to a story that you've. Yeah, that's why I'm not really a storyteller. It is, and that's why though I think that's why we get up five, ten, fifteen times, uh, you know, you know, o- over and over and over and over again because. Those stories, what you just said, you do it, you go, wow, that was great. You come back, you're like, shit, it's not hitting. Then you go back and you go, okay, now I got to take the real story, then I got to find some punchlines. I got to write some punchlines within the story. So I, I'll give you an example. The um, the soccer, my son playing soccer and getting beaten by the Latinos. <laughs> that does very well in LA, by the way, because there's so many Mexicans <laughs> and stuff. So people know Imagine. right away what I'm talking about. But in the joke, I say, you know, our team lost 21 to 3, right? In reality, <laughs> they did not lose 21 to 3. They <laughs> lost 5 nothing, or it was 6 nothing, whatever it was. But it really happened. The, the actual stuff did happen where I was watching. I, I, I basically graphed my own hopes and dreams of my son being a <laughs> soccer player, which, by the way, he's a really good soccer player. Mm-hmm. But you realize how good these other kids are. Right. And the fact is, I still believe in the heart, my heart of hearts that my son is a good enough athlete where if he decided I really want to go and try and make it in college or whatever level, I feel he could get really close. But it's just, it was one of those moments where you realize, wow, I've got to dedicate, this kid's got to play six, seven days a week. Right. And so this, this, so we had a good team. We go to the field. This other team, the Latinos, they're just, first of all, they were chubbier than us, but they were faster than us. <laughs> they were stronger than us. They had better ball skills. And I, was, and, and I left going, you know, these guys, this is like, their families are, are a lot of them, not to, not to stereotype, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of poverty there. And this is kind of their thing. Yeah. The father, the mother, everybody. So these kids, they probably practice two or three times a week. They right. play two or three games on the weekend. And during the week, they probably go right to soccer. Like that's all they do. So these guys play six, seven times a week. So the point being like, how do I put that whole thing into a story? And how do I talk about like, like your dreams being shattered? Right. And so number one, saying, okay, we lost the soccer game five nothing doesn't sound as bad as saying we lost 21 to three. <laughs> you know what you should do? You should give out the pamphlet when everybody's walking out and just have everything that you talked about and how truthful it was. Like, how, <laughs> That's a great how, idea. How was the truth? And just... That's actually a great idea. That's yeah. a really good idea to be like, what you saw tonight, here's what inspired it in the reality. Yeah, and I swear to God, you would post that on Instagram and like, you know, you could cross like what you thought was true and what was well, not true. Well, I'll give you true. another one. I'll give you another one. That's actually really funny because I do a joke about um, trying to trying to kind of cheat the system and get your money back for stuff. Right. <laughs> and so I talk about how one time I'd booked a hotel room for 4th of July near Los Angeles, near the water, to take the family. It was a last minute trip. Take the family. We live in LA. Right. But I was in the park on 4th of July. Most people go to watch fireworks. And um, I felt bad. I was in the park with my kids and nobody else was in the park. And I felt like a bad dad. I go, we didn't, we're not taking them for fireworks. So I go to my wife. I go, let's get a hotel room. Let's go watch the fireworks by the water. She goes, cool. 
We book the room. You know how it is when you book a room last minute, it's non-refundable. Right. As we drive towards the water, Marina del Rey, it gets foggier and foggier. And I realize, oh no, <laughs> we're not gonna be able to watch the fireworks, but I've already paid for this hotel room. I can't get my money back. Right. So I tell my wife, I go, you know what? That's fine. We'll make the best of it. Let's go upstairs. We'll enjoy it. We'll make it a staycation. We'll enjoy the room. We go to the room. I swear to God, the room was nasty. <laughs> and my wife's like, I'm not staying here. And I go, babe, we paid for it. We should stay. She's like, no, we live 10 minutes away. We should go home. <laughs> and I go, I go, you know what? Let's just go down to the pool. Let's just go hang out at the pool. Let's see what's that. Go down to the pool. I swear to God, the pool was dinky, like small. I'm like, this is just so, it was just kept getting more and more disappointing. <laughs> And I'm stuck because I'm like, I can't get my money back. <laughs> and part of me wants to stay and just rough it out. But my wife's like, let's get the hell out of here. This just lose the $300. Get out of here. So we ordered food. Actually, it was hamburgers. We ordered food by the pool. And the kids are eating. And as we're eating, suddenly um, either the hot tub or the pool, everybody that was in it starts running out. And I go over and I go, what's going on? And some guy goes, yeah, somebody just threw up in the pool. Either it was in the pool or hot tub, I forget. All right. And I go, oh. So I tell my wife, I go, you know what? I got an idea. <laughs> so I go to the front desk and I go, hey, man, I booked a place. to. We, we wanted to use your pool today and we came for the night and all that. And someone just threw up in the pool. So we can't really use your pool. And so I know it's non-refundable. You should pay me back. And the Such guy. Such an Iranian thing to yeah, do. Yeah, you're right, right? And the guy was like, I'm so sorry. He gave me the refund. Is that right? Yeah. So, and then we went home. We drove home, and we're so happy. It was, <laughs> I was like, now that's yeah, that's the real story. But in the in the story on stage, I say we were sitting there, and somebody, and people were running out, and somebody said someone just pooped in the pool. That's the story. I change it, right? All oh, right. And then I go, I go to my wife. I say, I got this. I go to the front desk. I go, somebody just pooped in your pool. Uh, I gotta go. You know, and the guy's like, here's your money. And then I go, I go home. I take my kids. I take them to the side. I give them each ten dollars. I said, I hope you learned your lesson today. Uh, and I said, and this is for, and I said, thank you for pooping in the pool. <laughs> so, so in the in the story, my kids pooped in the pool. Yeah, right? Right? right. And it's funny because some guy saw me do that. Some Iranian, older Iranian guy who was upset about my jokes about Trump. Right. He then in his email to me about how upset he was about my jokes about Trump. He goes, and then you ended by encouraging kids to poop in the pool. <laughs> and he goes, I can't believe you made your kids poop in the pool. That's a disgrace to our community. And I was like, no, the kids didn't poop in the pool. But he thought it was real. Well, that's a great right. idea to do yeah. a little guide and be like, this is yeah. what happened. Well, I think that's what that happens with, with, with stories is sometimes you're like, oh, this is a great story. But if you don't have a really satisfying close to the story that ends in like a nice buttoned up punchline, it can just fall by the wayside. I have all, all sorts of stories about my daughter that I would tell, but there's nothing that really landed hard. So the story would just kind of like disappear in favor of jokes that I knew would have like a, a stronger punchline. Like like the threesome joke I had, I go, that's a, I was like, hey, what time's that girl getting here? Right. That will always work. Yeah. And that's the end <laughs> of a, so that's, I mean, is it a true story? No, I didn't have a threesome with my best friend from high school. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like threesomes. If anyone was listening, anyway. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, so I I just added that for the punchline. I kind of feel like as a, I I don't like lying in comedy, but I think the punchline can always be a lie. I think that's right. kind of anything that's kind of the rule. Like you can always lie in your. Well, punch you exaggerate. Line. You got to do that. Like 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 what I was saying. So you could take like that's why those Tuesday nights when there's empty are great nights to talk about your daughter, because you find the, you will find the punchlines. Yeah. Because if you go up there. Start talking about your daughter, and I have this daughter, and she's this, you know, this, you know, she's this old, and you know, and they were, you've been telling me some of the stories, but you you start to lay it out. You know, she went to Berkeley. She's liberal. You know, I'm pretty liberal, but the other day she said, you know, blah 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 blah. Or she's got a friend who's like doesn't define their gender, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for I sure. Was just, I'm, just, I'm starting to work on a bit now about um, how, because because part of it is you, you got to lay out the theme. Here's the theme of what this joke is going to be. Then you get into the joke and you tell the joke. Where do you start, though? Do you start with uh, like the center of the show in some kind of way, or do you start with one joke that maybe becomes a whole tour? You start with you start with whatever's on your mind you want to talk about. You go, okay, so here's something I want to talk about. Um, I'll give you the I'll give you the genesis of a current joke. First of all, even now when I when I'm in town in L.A., I'll try and get up maybe five six times a week. So I'll get up Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wow, doing 15 minutes at a time. All right, Comedy Store Laugh Factory. I'll do both of those, and so that's six sets, right? So in that six sets, I go. I want to talk about some stuff. So for example, 
let's take the skiing bit. The skiing bit actually happened. Right. Now, did I tell the kid, fuck you, Ryan? I did not tell him that. <laughs> but I did think that. Right. Because it all, it, it, all of it happened up to that point of the other dad says, I'm tired. Can you take off four? I said, I got him. Right. I go up on stage and I see his son going down and his legs getting wider and wider and I'm about to have a heart attack so I'm like, oh my God, he's gonna die. And I ski all the way down to him and I go, are you okay, pal? And he's like, that was fun. And in my mind, I thought, <laughs> fuck you, Ryan, but I didn't say it. <laughs> but if I but if I do that in stand up and I go, oh, and I thought, fuck you, yeah, Ryan, but right, I said to right. him, yeah. oh, Ryan, it's okay, yeah. no. Yeah. So when you say fuck you, Ryan, people are like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And so if I were writing a scene in a TV show or in a movie, mm-hmm. he would have said, fuck you, Ryan, right. you know? Yeah. Um, so you can go on stage and that starts with the premise. You got to lay the premise out. I say, don't take your kids skiing. Now they know. That's like, that's like it's like if it were if I were doing a mm-hmm. TED talk. Right. Don't take your kids skiing. Boom. Right. Let me tell you why. All right. It's the most heart attack inducing. It's the most you know stressful. And now I've laid out the thing. Now I start telling the story. And within the story, people see some jokes coming and going. You know, you discover little silly things when I do the. This is how I ski, like I'm just moving my hips side to side and it looks like I'm doing fast, like speed walking. <laughs> um, that came about because I was just riffing it one night and mm-hmm. one of these, you know. So when it comes to like, for example, something like with him and his experience at Target with his daughter, it's about him saying like, I went to Target with my daughter, she's this age, and then just starting to find like the things she wanted or maybe the things you wanted her to get or yeah. or, or, or the cost of something or, or the fact that your dad or mom never came to you came with you to wherever you, you know what I'm saying, when you went shopping, you know, when yeah. you went to the thing, yeah, right? Or, 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 or your daughter asking you for your opinion and you not really having an opinion. Because I, I ran into this recently. I was watching the, the TV show Blackish. I was watching it with my eight-year-old daughter and 10-year-old son and we're sitting there and they have kids in the show. So I'm like, this is gonna be a kid-friendly show. And the first episode, great, kid-friendly, no problem. Second episode is about the dad walking in on his son, teenage son, masturbating. <laughs> so I'm sitting next to my eight-year-old daughter and 10-year-old son when this happens. And the dad walks in, the teenage boy's masturbating, and the dad goes, whoa, and he walks out. And right away, my teen, my little eight-year-old daughter goes, what happened? What just happened? <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, and, and this is, all these thoughts are going through my head, because, again, old-school dad would say, oh, nothing, honey, you just make up a lie. Oh, nothing, honey, he, he hurt his toe, so he had to leave. Modern dad says, when things like this happen, confront it and you know, be honest with them. So these thoughts are going in my head. I go, do I tell her? <laughs> Is this the time to tell an eight-year-old about masturbation? Or what do we yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. So I go, uh, I go, I, I found the middle ground. I go, oh, I go, oh, you know what? His um, his peepee was out because that's what it was. And I go, the daddy saw the peepee and he left. And she goes, well, it's just it's his daddy. So is it a big <laughs> deal? And I go. Well, I go, you know, people like to be private. And I go, he's a teenager, he's older now, so his pee shouldn't be seen by his daddy. And so she's like, okay. So I thought, oh God, we're done. <laughs> Next scene, the dad goes into the room to the mom and goes, I walked in on the son, pl- on, our, on our boy playing with himself. My daughter, what's that? <laughs> oh my oh, God. I'm like, these guys are relentless. <laughs> so then I then I was, I felt like I should kind of, and this is me being like too modern in a way. I was like, <laughs> well, baby, I go, um, you know, when, when kids get a little like teenagers, like sometimes they just like to like you know like they you know play with their pee pee a little bit, and she's like they do, <laughs> and I'm like yeah, and then, and then she goes did you, and I was like oh no, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like it was just this oh, can yeah. of worms, and it kept going deeper and deeper, <laughs> and part, again your your mind is going to be honest with them, and the other side's like just get out of this conversation. <laughs> I forget how I got out of it, but here's the funny the the, the icing on the whole thing was that night. You know, I'm checking in with my wife at night. We're like in bed talking. I go, oh, by the way, I go, this happened. And, you know, I was watching the show and this happened. And I and I told her, I told Mila, our daughter, I said, I, I told her, you know, this is what I told her. And my wife's like, what? You did what? I go, yeah, I thought it was good to be honest. She's like, are you out of your mind? She's, like, She's eight years old. She's not ready for that talk. I go, I didn't know. I was trying to be a good dad. So all this stuff builds, right? Yeah, and, then yeah. it's, and then, and then, and then you, you got to, you got to, Throughout writing that, you need to get in and observe your own thoughts. Like one of the things when I've done it on stage now a few times is I've said when this was con- when I was confronted with this, I thought, well, I could just you know brush it under the ru- you know sweep it under the carpet or under the rug, right. or I could talk about it. And then I said, and, and I figured the problem is either way, I feel like this is going to lead to therapy in the future where my daughter's talking like you know <laughs> my dad, you know. So you know what I'm saying? You yeah, just got to exactly. get in and observe yeah. it. 
Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and what amazes me and what impresses me, and may- maybe even Leonardo DiCaprio in <laughs> some ways, is that as you said, uh, one day you go out there and you have the right energy. Uh, how do you prepare yourself to come in the right mindset and right energy? Because you can't just go up there and not be. I, the... I have a, th- a thought about that, and Moss can eat while I'm saying this. I ate. So you <laughs> ate your burger? I ate my burger. Jesus, you got your burger. I've been talking. Oh my god. I've been trying to so, give you an uh, assist, bro. So you know, like I, my, my my first, I was an actor for. I, I've, I've done Broadway. I've done a lot of Off Broadway. Right. And when I f- the first big play I did, you know, eight o'clock curtain, and I would arrive at six o'clock. I'd get in the mirror and nah, I'm doing my mouth stuff and think about my character and da 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 and and research my character and look in the mirror again and for like an hour and a half and then it's half hour. You're like, what? And then by the time you get on stage, whoever you are, Bill as a person, right. is so far removed from your life that what you're presenting on stage isn't really authentic. And even though you're doing the quote unquote character, you really are doing yourself, right? right? Exactly. So, and I remember Frank Langella, I don't know if you know who he is, he's a, he's a great actor, but he, he had an interview about that. And he said when he started, he was like that. He would just go to the theater and look at himself and do exercises. And, and, my, and then he goes, now I just like, you know, I have a fight with my wife, I drop the kids off, da, da, da. I get at theater at 7.30. So when I'm on stage at eight o'clock, my entire life is informing me. So even though he's doing other people's lines and he's acting like in some Shakespearean or whatever show, the the, the energy and the the hurly burly of his life is still is still affecting it, and he can still actually use that. So I think that, and I think you're really like Maz is one of these people like, and apparently Malkovich is like this as an actor too. Like you, you you'll be like just having a conversation like da da da. Oh, you gotta go on stage. Okay, boom, and he just walks right on stage. And I think a lot of people. I think that's, I don't know, for me, I think that's kind of the, the, the real magic is when you can just be yourself, having a glass of wine with Jane Masada, and then you're on, Miles, you just walk on stage. Yeah. It, it, it actually is a way, I think, of dealing, because if you, if you make too big, de- too big of a deal out of it, I think that it makes you nervous. If, you're, if you have too much time to think, it makes you nervous. If you, if you can sit there and just, as long as you know, like right now we're on a, whatever it is, eight, nine city tour, and so every night, I know I'm going to be doing that hour, hour plus. Right. And I know, for the most part, I know how the story goes. I said it's like a train, A to B to C to Z, you know, D, E, all the way. And once in a while, I'll leave the train and I'll do some crowd work and there'll be a Chinese, Vietnamese guy in the front right. and we'll talk to him for a minute. And then I know how to go back to the story. And then there's times, even tonight, where I was doing a bit and I go, oh, in my mind, I'm going, oh man, I forgot to do that part that would set this part up. So then I kind of go back to it because I know it so well. So when you are doing shows where you know the rhythms of where you're gonna go, you can just be wherever and just do it. There are times when like I sit there and I go, okay, I haven't done an hour in about a few months because I've been home and whatever. And now I just wanna look at my set list just to kind of mm-hmm. know where I'm going. Then once you're up there, you're good. A lot of it's you know years and years of doing it. You're confident. You're gonna talk to the audience if you have to. Um, something's gonna take you some places. And then, and then like you were saying, there are times when the beauty of doing these shows in LA are we bring our emotions to the stage. There's been times where I've been exhausted and I'll go up on stage and say, guys, I'm exhausted. You know, I just had the longest day and I get into it a little bit. You just tell everybody that. I tell them, hey guys, yeah. I'm exhausted. And I get into it and whatever, whatever. And it ends up being a blast and I come up with some stuff. Um, there are times where I've had like tragedy in my life, but I had to do a big show. Right. And in a big show, you can't go up there and just say, hey, you know, I yeah. lost somebody dear to me right now. Right. You got to put on the clown face and be happy and just get through the set. And sometimes it actually helps you because for 20 minutes or an hour, or whatever that is, you're away from those thoughts. How did you do that that, that time? Is it one time or several times? It's been a few times. All right. It's life, times. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A few Always. Times. Yeah. 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 Th- that's one more thing that I'm r- super interested in. I mean, I, I talked to, uh, I worked in football before and I talked to the head coach of the team and they're always on, in, uh, there's always pressure on them. There's like uh, mm-hmm. stuff in the news, there are players, there are coaches, there are their CEO in the club and they have to win matches. Uh, yeah. They can't take time off, even yeah. if they have a bad time at home with, yeah. with their kids or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's exactly it. And this is even more because you, you I mean, we see it in your face if you I feel had, bad. You know, there's a quarterback mm-hmm. named Brett Favre. Right. Brett Favre, he's a quarterback for the, uh, he was a quarterback for the um, Packers. He was one of my favorites, actually. Yeah, Green Bay Packers. Yeah. So I remember hearing the story of how I think his father died 
and he played that day or that night or something, and he like dedicated the game to his dad. Now, I've lost a brother and a sister in my life, and when I lost my brother, uh, it was on a Tuesday, and I had shows that Friday. We weren't gonna do the funeral for a little bit or something, so I actually remember saying, well, I said I should go do the shows, because you, part of you says, you know, that's what he would want. Yeah. And I remember actually I had I had a radio show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, on Thursday in Chicago. I live in LA. I had a, uh, I had a, uh, and then I had stand-up shows in Chicago Friday, Saturday, and I was supposed to come back Sunday. And I said, I said to the family, look, I'll just help plan everything from afar, and, I'll just, and I don't wanna, you know, because the other problem being a comedian is, it's not like you're in an office where you can say, hey, Chuck, can you just handle my case? Yeah. You're the comedian, you gotta go do it. So it was a Tuesday, I said, okay, I'll keep going. So on that Thursday, I woke up, so when, when, when you do the radio show, it's this radio show where you fly out at like six in the morning from LA, you land in Chicago around noon, and then you do the radio show that night, and then it airs that weekend. Um, so I got up at six in the morning, got on the airplane on Thursday, this is two days after my brother passed away, get on the plane, fly to Chicago, land in Chicago, I'm on the tarmac and I wake up, because I sleep, I, I sleep on the flight. I wake up and I think to myself, how the hell am I gonna be funny? Mm. I was like, I can't do this. And I landed and the first thing I did was call my manager. I go, listen man, I don't think I can do this. So I got out of it that weekend. So mm. they got someone else to fill for me, fill in for me on the radio show and someone took my spots for that weekend and I was, you know, you gotta put it out there. You gotta go, apologies to anybody who bought tickets, tragic, tragic moment, blah, 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 blah. So. Those were times where I, I couldn't get on stage. So you, you know? didn't do it? I got off, yeah, I, I, you had to. But there yeah. are times again, like like I said, when my sister, either, it, it was either, I think she just passed away, and I, and I had this quote unquote corporate event in, in Vegas, and I almost used it as like a getaway from it all. Mm -hmm. And I just went, and it was 20 minutes, and I went on stage, and, and like before going on stage, I kinda like looked up and was like, you know, just be with me, you know? I kinda had her on my mind. And I went and did it, and then I remember being, it was actually, you know what, I'm thinking about this right now. Some crazy stuff happens in the world and there's no explanation for it. So I went to Vegas for this thing. I get off stage, I'm alone, and I'm going by the bar and they have uh, um, Don Julio 1842, 1942 I think, that's what it's called. This is really tall, expensive bottle of tequila. And I asked the guy, I go, how much for a shot of that? And he's like, uh, or, you know, on the rocks. He's like, 45 bucks. I go, okay, give me a double shot. And, wow. I, and, and the reason I did that was because I go, my, if my sister were here, she'd be like, let's do it. Yeah. So give me the double shot. So I'm sipping my tequila, just enjoying myself and thinking about her. I sit down at a blackjack table. I'm not a big gambler, but I'm just, you know, trying to keep my mind playing, playing, playing. This young guy sits next to me, starts playing. Now, Conversations that I've had with young people in their 20s, I'm 47, people in their 20s, conversations I've had with them a lot is, we don't have a lot in common. I mean, we do some things, but a lot we don't. So if I make a reference, let's say, to the movie Goodfellas or Godfather or whatever, whatever, they're not gonna know what I'm talking about. You know. But if we talk about modern stuff, yes. This kid sits next to me, right away, he's 20-something, white kid. He's like, yeah, I'm here with my family, and he goes, I, he goes I'm a fan of yours, man. I go, oh, thanks. It just so happens, right? Go, thanks and we start talking and the next thing I know we're having this great conversation and he's like whatever however it came about our conversation was th this was a 20 something year old who was you know it was like it was like a 47 year old in the body of a 20 something year old mm. we had this he was getting my references I was like I was so impressed with the kid and then I was asking him I said what's your name and he said my name's Colin and I go that's interesting and what that made me remember was when my father passed away, now I've lost a lot of people. This is not to bring everybody down on this podcast. <laughs> my father was old, and uh, he just you know wasn't doing well. But the nurse that helped take care of him, and the nurse who earned my and my sister's trust at the time, my sister was alive at that point, and the nurse who was overseeing my dad, and then my dad had it was in the hospital and he had another uh, stroke, and and this nurse we trusted him so much. We asked him. We said what what would you do if it were your dad? Would you keep him alive still or would you let him go? And he goes, guys, I gotta be honest with you. You know, you guys, you know, I you know, I, I really, we bonded and stuff. He goes, if it were my dad, I'd let him go. And the name of that nurse was Colin. Wow. So this guy Colin 
was the guy who was kind of like our, our guardian angel in that moment. Right. And then when my sister passes away, I'm sitting there at this blackjack table right. and this random 20 something year old who just is very different named Colin shows up. And I was like, I felt like that was my sister going like, you're not alone. Yeah, I hope you won a lot of money at that blackjack table or this story sucks. <laughs> no, I lost the money, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was amazing, and you're not yeah. even a believer, are you? No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not really, not really religious. Right? Yeah. As a matter of yeah. fact, when, when, when I lost my sister, it made me doubt God yeah. even more. Even more. Even more, yeah. Even though Colin was there. Even though Colin was there. I mean, listen, I don't, it's not that I, I'm, not a, I'm not an atheist. I, don't, I feel there's an energy. That's what I'm saying. I think there's, a, there's something there. I, I went to Japan this past uh, I talked about it, this, right. the holidays, the, and they have Shintoism, which is this whole mm. belief of, of the spirit, and it lives on. And I was like, that's the closest to mm. what I kind of believe. Okay. So I'm not religious, but I do feel there's the spirit, there's an energy, there's some things that happen that you can't explain. And so I believe in that, but I don't believe in like, you know, this God says, you know, don't, you know, whatever. Kill all infidels. Do kill all infidels. Like, I don't believe in killing all infidels. Not even that? Yeah. I mean, a lot of times, listen, I say to each his own, if, if the religion helps the person and people, right. go for it. But mm. don't impose it on people. Right. I hate yeah. it when religion comes and says, oh, uh, gay marriage is wrong. Or they say, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, oh, half of this crap, like, you kill the other guy. Like, you know, you're not Christian. <laughs> don't you eat bacon. Be don't eat bacon. It's just some of the silliest stuff. I right. just, I'm not into it. You, you brought up your dad. Can I ask you a question about when you came to, oh, or you went to America with, with your parents? I mean, it was a, you have talked about it a bit uh, in different interviews, but it's kind of a crazy story how you ended up in the United States. You have it was late 78 and and there was protests in the streets of Iran, um, and I think a lot of people, a lot of Iranians felt that the Shah was going to be able to uh, squash the protests because I think there'd been other opposition throughout that he'd been able to stop. So my father was on business in New York City, and he told my mom, it was, our, it was, it was around the holidays, and my, my dad said, why don't you bring um, Mariam, who, who was my sister. And he was a pretty successful businessman. My father was a successful yeah. businessman, yeah. So he goes, why don't you bring Mariam and Maziar to um, New York for a couple weeks and uh, come on vacation, I'm here on business, and you guys can hang out. So we went, and I think in the back of their minds, they thought that the protest would die down and we'd go back. Right. But in, the, in in actuality, the protest got, grew and grew and grew. And we just never went back. So I always talk about, I say we packed for two weeks and we stayed for 40 years. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. Most of the time when you hear an immigrant, especially coming from Middle East to, to United States or Sweden or whatever, uh, you hear about uh, war torn countries coming there with nothing and, and then making a, a successful company or something like that. And your father actually went the other way. I, I, yeah, my dad came with a lot of money. So my dad was a successful businessman in Iran. He owned an electric company. So a lot of the electricity that would be on the roads and stuff, his, his, his company had done. So my father was very successful. He was this larger than life character. And he brought the money to America and then he invested it in property. Now in the early, early 80s, like whatever, 80, 81 or whatever, I think he, he bought some property and was able to like turn it, you know, sell it for more and made profit. Right. So he goes, oh, this is great. That's what I'll do. I'll take a, a lot of my money that I brought and I'll buy a bunch of properties. Well, he bought the properties and then the recession of the 1980s hit. So suddenly interest rates started going up and nobody was buying his properties and the values were going down. So he was bleeding money. And eventually he ended up losing a lot of that money and basically he moved back to Iran at some point to try and do some business in Iran and that worked out okay. And towards the end of his life, he pretty much died broke, you know, but he was generous. Like he would say to himself, he goes, he goes, I live to be 76 years old. And he's like, but I feel like I live 700 years. Mm -hmm. He was very generous, gave to a lot of people. And my, the lesson I learned from him a little bit is, first of all, I want to be generous. Um, but secondly, I learned to kind of plan a little bit for the future. So whereas my father never had like a retirement plan or anything like that, I've already started to put money towards that or for college funds for kids. I've already um, So there's a conservative side of me in the, terms of that. You know, so it's the lessons learned. Always something good coming out of that, right? Yeah, yeah. And then also, one last thing on that. Uh, I s saw somewhere that you told uh, somebody about you never felt fully American and never f felt fully uh, Iranian. I think yeah. many immigrants can 
Yeah, you live between two worlds because you come to a new country, you're six years old, you start trying to blend in with all the kids and like when you bring your buddies to your house, your parents are making weird smelling food, <laughs> right? They have loud, they have loud, strange accents. Your I love the story about your mom coming with a mink coat to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was again, <laughs> an, an, ex an exaggerating stuff. That yeah. was actually my aunt who did it, but still. <laughs> but um, yeah. it's, uh, it's it, it, you, you feel out of place with Americans and then your parents take you to one of their parties with all their Persian friends and they're all speaking to you in Persian and talking to you in, in, in a very way that you like or they want you to listen to their music you're like I'm just not into your stuff you know so right. I never felt Iranian enough I never felt American enough it's just this between two worlds kind of a thing yeah there's a word for it in Swedish it's called uh, fucked up <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> um the Netflix special. How do you get one Netflix special? Do they like yeah. call you up? Like where do you, you guys get the Netflix? Yeah, you <laughs> send them an email and you say, "I'm ready." No, <laughs> she um, ready. You know, I think part of it is like you know, part of it is obviously Bill will tell you they. I think that they probably know some comics who they feel like okay, this guy either has a big enough following. They started doing that a lot, where they just went all over the world and they were like, "Oh, mm. this guy's huge in." whatever, Bangladesh, let's give them a special because people will watch it. Because ultimately, let's face it, they just want viewers, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that's... Uh, I understand they don't tell you about how many viewers your show has. Yeah, they keep right. those numbers. Yeah, they keep them closed. That's yeah. weird, though. Well, I don't how know. How do you like, I, negotiate about the contract? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. But <laughs> but but going into that, I'd already, I'd already had, th I think, three Showtime specials, and I had the other special that was a, a comedy, uh, the Comedy Central special. So I'd, I'd had a, I, I keep putting it out. I keep put because as Bill was saying, I keep writing new material because a lot of it's based on my life. So, for example, one of my specials was when my son was born. So, if I went on stage right now today and I started talking about telling a joke about my son being a baby when my son is actually ten years old, I would feel like a <laughs> fake. Right. Yeah, I couldn't do it. So, I have to keep writing. So, I keep. If you follow my specials, you'll see where my kids are, how old they are. You'll see where I am politically. You'll kind of you can see my growth. You can chart it. So. When I got to Netflix, I I knew the guy who was buying the the shows at that point because he he was a Just for Laughs um, uh, uh, producer, and so I knew him. And then really, you want to be able to have a strong hour, so you tell him I got this thing and this, and then and then the other thing is what's your idea? So my idea at the time was this was we taped it in, uh, I think it was uh, it was March of 2017, I think when. Trump had just come into the White House and he'd done the anti, you know, the Muslim ban, all that stuff. So I said, hey, I got an idea because I just started to do stand up at the Kennedy Center, which is one of the most prestigious theaters in America. And it's very kind of known to be intellectual and this and that. So I said, hey, and I was supposed to do a show there. And I talked to my manager. I go, what if we shot the special there? Mm -hmm. No one had ever shot a special there. Oh, wow. And it happened that I shot my special, and then George Lopez shot his special, like in like three nights back to back, or like it was two nights back to back, whatever it was. Were you first? I think I was first, but his might have come out before mine. But right. anyway, <laughs> but long story short, though, I think that the Netflix people saw the value of that. They said, "Okay, this is an immigrant basically doing a show at a prestigious theater in D.C., which is basically Trump's backyard at this point." So they were like, "Let's go." <laughs> so that's part of what it is. Yeah. Part of it is like finding the right place. With, like I'm trying to, I, in all honesty, I'm trying to shoot my next special at the United Nations. Right. I don't think they'll let me, but it would be great if they let me. That would, would be amazing. To. That's what I'm saying. So if you go to Netflix, I got this. I, if I, I've, I'm in the process of trying to get the approval, but I doubt they'll let me because I do too many. Like I do Trump jokes, so right. yeah. I don't think they can. They, I don't think they would let me do it. Hmm. But then my backup was if they don't let me do it. Jamie came up with this idea. I had the idea too. Was get a parking lot or something near the United Nations and go from a parking lot near the United Nations <laughs> and talk about how like I tried to get in there, they wouldn't let me in. So here we are. That would be really funny. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And I, I was say, telling myself that uh, please do a podcast with Americans and not talk about Trump. But but you led us into it. Yeah. I mean, is yeah. it that that bad as it sounds from here? Bill? Well, I mean, has we, we've talked a lot changed? about politics and Trump. You know, the funny thing about, uh, I think, U.S. politics versus European politics on some level is that uh, w we react to things that are being said. We're not really reacting to things that are actually happening on the ground. So if, if Obama was president for the past two, three years, um, 
most people, they wouldn't know the difference in terms of what's what's happening in their pocketbook, what's happening in their job, what's happening in their life and their marriage. So day-to-day life in America isn't different, but the perception right. that everything's going tits up in a ditch is huge. And so people are like freaking out just on the perception. Meanwhile, the economy is banging, unemployment's low, GDP is good. So it's sort of a weird, it's like this, I don't know what the, what the, what the word is. It's, it's a weird like conflation of, of different ideas because people think, you know, it's like Chicken Little, the sky is falling. But okay, what's happening in your life where the sky is falling? Well, Bill, and, and Bill, hold on. But here's the okay, thing. I, so Brandon, Bill, there's so, different things with the travel ban. And I know no, there's, so Bill, like, so Bill and I have been talking about it. Was, that's what's great about being comics on the road is you get to talk about this stuff. Right. So his view is very different than my view because what you just said, I, I've heard this before where people say that. They go, well, you know, the economy's good, this and that. And it's true. Most people are not affected. This is where you realize, this is where you realize that People aren't affected until they're affected. So can I just mm. cut in with one question? Yeah. Uh, are you back going? Are you going back to Virginia now and then? Oh no, God, never, never, never going right. back there. All right. So you basically <laughs> live in, I live L- in LA. LA. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, right. Yeah. So you're not affected till you are affected. So I, this is what I say. So exactly what just Bill said. Because when when Trump won, I actually told my kids. I said, "Listen, he's the president." I go, "This is um, this country is a great country. I go, the way we change power is a great way." I go, and a, a lot of other countries, they take the other guy, they hang him. And then you, this new guy yeah. becomes a president. I go, we have a peaceful power. It's Norway, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what I said to them, I said, listen, we have to respect him and give him the benefit of the doubt, see what happens. And then that same weekend, he was tweeting about Saturday Night Live. And I go, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> like, I just lost my mind. But more importantly, when it comes to real world stuff, I personally know of people affected by the travel ban. Yeah. Let's take the travel ban, all right? That's what I know. So then I'm sure there are some people that are Latinos, whether they're Honduran or El Salvadoran or Guatemalan or whatever. I bet you there's people in that community that know about people being held and separated from the kids in at the border. Right. Um, now, you start looking at it, you go, there is real life repercussions. You're right, pocketbooks are good. Um, for the most part, whatever, life in America is a great country, but there are people being affected by the policies of this current dude. And I know for a fact when, when the travel ban happened, I've seen it now several times, families have been separated. I, I ran it, I met a, um, was, uh, I think it was, maybe it was Copenhagen. Maybe it was last night. It was last night or the night before. Maybe it was Paris. I forget what it was. A couple came up to me and they go, oh, by the way, very nicely, they go, by the way, we're, we're victims of the travel ban. I go, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, this is my wife and uh, I'm, I'm in America, but she can't come, so we had to come here. So I've left my wow. life to come here, and she's here. So, okay, what's you know? It sounds like okay, whatever. You're in Copenhagen or Paris, or whatever. Well, no, they have to restart their life in a new place because the travel ban is so strict. Right. Because they said we're going to give waivers. They haven't. They've given very few waivers. Mm-hmm. And so, people's lives have been affected. There's people who needed medical attention, weren't getting medical attention. I don't know if it's true or not. I didn't do the research on this, but somebody contacted me and said that that they knew someone. I think it was Norwegian or Swedish or something who had a Swedish passport or Norwegian passport, but they were born in Iran. Right. They were trying to come to America, and back before before the travel ban, they could just get on a plane with their Swedish and Norwegian passport. Right. They were coming to America because their father was on his deathbed, and because they now were born in Iran and have done not they have not no relationship to the government of Iran, but because they were born in Iran, they would have had to go through the process of getting the visa, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera, and it would have been too late, the father's dead. Yeah. So these are real life things that are happening. So what I was saying to to counter Bill's point is, I do feel- Are you liberal a, as well? I, I am liberal. I, I have a lot of uh, Republican uh, family. I, w- w- finish your thought, because you're in the middle of something. I feel that there are a lot of things that are real life repercussions under Trump. I really think Trump is, a bad person. I feel that his advisors are bad people. If you look at the history of this guy, Stephen Miller, who's one of his advisors, John Bolton, who's a, a, a hawk when it comes to wars, Mike Pompeo, if you look at these guys' histories, you go, wow, these guys have quite often been on what I consider the wrong side of history and the wrong side of things. When they go in and they say, okay, uh, you know, LGBTQ people in the military, and then they turn that around, and they go, no, you can't do that. I go, well, okay, that's discriminatory against them. Mm-hmm. When they come out and they say, um, you know, uh, we want to repeal Obamacare. Is Obama- Obamacare broken? Sure, let's fix it, let's fix it, right? But they say, no, we want to repeal it, and then they say, 
pre-existing conditions. We're going to keep pre-existing conditions. This whole thing with pre-existing conditions to me was one of those things when I first became an adult and realized that if you have a pre-existing condition, insurance companies won't cover you. Yeah. That made no sense to me. I go, wait a minute. So that's when you need them. Yeah. And now they're saying, no, you're, you're screwed. It, I w- you, you should have gotten us before yeah. you got diagnosed with cancer. Now you've got cancer and you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. in, in bills. So it's coming out now that even though Trump had said, oh, we're going to protect pre-existing conditions, that recently when he was trying to change the – uh, um, you know, get rid of Obamacare, he was going to get rid of pre-existing conditions. So you sit there and you go, wait a minute, there are real life repercussions. And I feel personally, and, I, and in all honesty, I feel that he's a little senile. Mm-hmm. I feel that he's a, I feel that he is a um, conspiracy theorist. Oh, for sure. Um, and he's paranoid. He even said it, he was at a speech the other day. He goes, we need to be more paranoid. So he's the old grandfather who you sit there and you go, wow, this guy's really out of touch with kind of the modern yeah, times. Right. And his policies, because he's got enough power and because there's enough people that are in support of this right-leaning policies that they kind of let him, let him do it, you know? So this stuff is stuff that's yeah. hurting us. Well, I well, mean, one, we're, one thing I, I feel like I have to count, sure, counter sure. that because I sound like an insensitive asshole when I say <laughs> nothing's changed. <laughs> I, I kind of what I mean is like there's there's certain things that's why I do the joke about the Nazis right because I got in this huge Facebook kerfluffle about a woman saying Nazis on the rise and I was like I don't think that's actually true and the, and the facts are it's not true and the facts are the KKK is like the least funded it's been in, in, in years I mean when I grew up in Virginia in the, the 70s and 80s there were KKK marches all the time but now there's one march and people are like oh my god look the amount of black people people that have been shot and killed by cops has decreased for the past three years. But if you look at the media, it looks like it's tripled or doubled. Uh, abortion is just as easy to access abortion everywhere in the country as How it was. How much has it dec- decreased? Do you know? I don't know, but you can look it up. It's every, right. For the past three I years, it's gone down. I thought, Bill, with the abortion thing, I've, I've read a couple of articles, and some of this stuff is is obviously, it's, it's um, you know... Um, anecdotal. Anecdotal here, there, it's different, right? But there was some place in, like, Texas or Kansas or something where they were taking the rights away I forget where it was, and people and women had to drive, yeah, you know, over the across the border to get it. And so when I hear about stuff like that, I do feel like you just said, I feel like, oh wow, we've made so much progress. And then I go, maybe I'm misreading this, and I read it and I go, no, this actually exists. There are places in America where women, yeah, you know, get knocked up and they want to get an abortion, they got to go drive somewhere and yeah. do it, like you know. But do you realize thing- in the days how many abortion clinics were bombed? Yeah. Do you know when the last yeah. time there's been an yeah. abortion like bombed? No, listen, it doesn't listen, but 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 the problem with that argument is again, it's kind of what you and I were talking about today, which is it that that doesn't mean it's not it is happening. Like yeah, the thing happening. you were talking about, like I don't know about Nazis, but the <laughs> fact is they have been they have been documenting more hate crimes in the past few years than ever before. Yeah. Now there could be a several reasons for it. One reason could be that now they're documenting more than they used to, meaning like the actual keeping of records has become a bigger interest now than it used to. That could be one. Sure. The other reason could be, and I I find that this I think there's no one reason. I think there's a handful of reasons. Yeah, it's a multivariate. So I think when you do have a president who uh, blames immigrants for certain things, I used to say this about Bush. When Bush would go up there, say there's an axis of evil, the people that were listening to him were not differentiating Iranian people from the government of Iran, right? right? And later right. on, at some point, Bush actually said, like, Muslim people are good or whatever, but it was too late already. So when you go up there and say there's an axe of evil, there's people that are evil that want to get you. It's Iraq, Iran, North Korea. Whoever is listening to this, mo- you know, most of this, the people on the ground that are your followers have just put into their head, Iranians, Iraqis, North Koreans are bad. So the next time they're at some event, or, or they see some Iranian or Middle Eastern or something doing something wrong. They go, hey, Alibaba, get out of this country. Yeah. Because you're part of the axis of evil. Sure. Now, that's some dude who is leading a life and has nothing to do with this crap. But unfortunately, it's already been delivered. So the same way when Trump goes up there and goes, Mexicans are saying rapists and immig- you know, they're rapists and they're drug dealers. And then, and then people go, well... You're racist against Mexicans. No, I, I love Mexicans. Oh, it's too late. You already said what <laughs> yeah. you said. And unfortunately, your your uh, uh, base is not going to differentiate, you know, Pablo working at the friggin', you know, uh, uh, Taco Bell and 
you know, the, the, the actual drug dealer. So what's mm-hmm. going to happen is one night your base is going to be at Taco Bell late at night and they're going to get the order wrong and he's going to go and be like, hey, Pablo, I told you, get out of my fucking country. You know, like, what I'm, <laughs> you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand you what you're saying. You do embolden those types of people by being the leader of the free world and using that kind of language. You can't just use that language and go, oh, I'm just kidding. I just said, no, your words have meaning. I'll give you a great example. I put this in my immigrant special. There was a guy in Kansas that took a gun. He was at a bar. There was two Indians minding their own business, engineers. He, I don't know what happened. He goes to his car. He gets a gun. I think he started arguing with them or something. Goes to his car, gets a gun, come back, shoots them both, gets in his car, takes off, goes to another bar. While he's at the other bar, he tells the bartender, I just killed an Iranian. I just killed a couple Iranians. Okay. So first of all, he didn't. He, one one of the Indians died. The other one lived. Uh, they weren't Iranian. They were Indians. And thirdly, where does this dude in Kansas City who's angry about whatever get the idea that he should go kill an Iranian? And lastly, th- these other guys had they. they, they I, I read a great article telling the story of one of the, the guy who died. He was just some dude who was looking for a job, engineering job in America. Yeah. Ended up in Kansas. Kansas had just gotten married. The wife was pregnant. He's got he's got mine in his own business. So where does this come from? It comes from Donald Trump and other people in leadership positions saying that brown people are coming to take over. And so whatever happened in that guy's mind, it was, you know, if you if if he had not embol- been emboldened, then it wouldn't be happening. So I do feel there are real repercussions to it all. Yeah, I, I, I also have a, a, a counter to that. There's a book called Hillbilly Elegy, which was a, you hear about that book? It was a big New York Times bestseller. It was written by like a, a Harvard law professor who was from, like, not West Virginia, Kentucky, or some white trash trailer place. And um, he'd experienced sort of before Trump was elected, this huge amount of resentment of of these white disenfranchised Americans feeling that Mexicans were taking over, foreigners were coming. They were feeling that everywhere, anyway, right? And then, uh, so when Obama was kind of, hey, it's all we are, all the world, and kumbaya, they were like, no, we're we're left out. With the, so when Trump came along, it, it, I, I feel like tr- Trump is a symptom of something happening in America as opposed to someone who's actually the progenitor of things happening in America. I no, mean, even, you, no, even you're with, right. even with not, gun control, like there's less mass right. shootings in America now than there were three years ago. Yeah, but we've had the, but we've had the biggest mass shootings. I mean, like that fifth the guy going to the free- at Pulse. I mean, this but whole th- no, forget the the th- the dude at the freaking uh, in Vegas that just started going nuts oh, at yeah. the concert. The po- listen, all this I agree. It's not it's not like oh life was rosy and then Trump showed up and he's the you know he's a Joker villain and a Batman and he's doing all this stuff. It's not that, but there is something to be said about leaders should be you know leading in a way uh, for where sure, they for don't sure. where they don't uh, uh, um, blame or 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 embolden people sure. to go out so I feel that this guy's rhetoric I think I think Trump is a you're right I think Trump is because because on paper Trump stands for everything that his base should hate he's an elite yeah. New Yorker who has Never always worked. been out for himself yeah. and has made money and, and that's it. Like he's, you know, 10 years ago, if you asked Trump about like the dude in whatever in Virginia or Arkansas, he'd be like, oh, you know, I, you know, I'd scratch my balls with those guys. I don't yeah. know, why, why, why would I go to Virginia? He probably used to call those places shitholes, right? Yeah, for sure. Right? But now that it's in his interest, he's turned around and he's playing the game and going like, oh, I'm here for us and da 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 So... I'm not saying Trump was some like evil genius who came out and did this. I just feel that if you're the leader of uh, a country, there is something to be said about you know being above it all and being a little more yeah. you know being a little more statesman and being a little uh, stately and, and 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 I do feel that there are results of him talking like that and you see it, dude. I every every time I see one of these stupid videos of some guy yelling at a group of Mexicans or Arabs or Iranians or whatever, every time they go, this Trump's America motherfucker, Trump's America, they, they <laughs> quote the guy. <laughs> and I'm like, if anything, if I were Trump, I swear to God, if anything, if he really wanted to go, look, I don't stand for any of this, he should come out and be like, I saw this video, it was very disturbing, this is not Trump's America, this is not what I want America to be. I'm telling you, there are good Muslims, there's good you know, in, in Mexicans, there's good this and this and this, and we're all American. And we have issues and we're going to work it out. 
I'm going after the bad guys, but let me, you know, let's find the bad guys. Let's not, because if we go after the good guys right. that just happen to be from the same thing, then mm-hmm. we're just as bad as what I'm claiming. You know what I'm saying? He, he's never come out yeah. to say well, that. Well, I, I would argue that he has on some level, even with Jesse Smollett, he goes, that's terrible. That's like the worst thing that could ever happen. And then Jesse Smollett ended up being a hoax. And then he's like, well, I knew it, you know, whatever. But I, I do think there's also a lot of confirmation by it. It's like when you're driving in your car and like you get cut off by someone. And then you look, and it's like it's like a white dude, and you're like, oh, okay. But then when you get cut off, and it's like an Asian woman, you're like these fucking Asian women can't drive, and it reinforces your confirmation. About it. Now, yeah, I think Trump is an idiot, and I do think he does embolden people, but I also think people are better than that. And I think as Americans, like I know so many Republicans, and they're like good people, and they're not going like, yes, Trump is our leader. They they know that he's adult, and they know that, um, and they kind of like shake their head at it. But I'm being told by a lot of my liberal friends that everyone who's Republican is evil or stupid, and then that makes me kind of go, "Well, we're all just people. We're, we're, we're closer. We're closer in, in thought and ideology as Americans. We're just human beings." And I think most people want to. It admit. comes to. It comes to. We can. I, Bill and I have been talking about this. It comes to people can have different ideas on stuff. Like I feel like, like you said, you know, if you know, there's Republican neighbors and living next to Democrats, and if their house of the Democrat is on fire, the neighbor's going to come and help you put it out, and vice versa. So we can get along on that stuff. Every once in a while, you run into a conversation with a guy that you've loved your whole life, who suddenly you'll be like, yeah, blah, 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 you know, I don't know about this wall. They go, I think the wall is great. You go, really? They go, yeah, I think it's good. They go, why? (laughs) And then you really want to hear their why. I'm open to it. And if they sit there and go, listen, our immigration immigration, uh, policies are broken, and a wall in such and such area would help bring the violence down, and it costs this much, that much, that much, you might sit there and go, okay, fine. But if they start going into that rhetoric of like, Mexicans are coming here and they're taking our thing and this, and you go, holy shit, like, you know what? It's better if we just don't talk about this <laughs> stuff because, because it, we're not gonna it's interesting go, that you say that you wanna hear their why because sometimes people just want to uh, they don't be want heard know. about their mm-hmm, why. Mm-hmm. And s- even sometimes if the uh, why is so stupid while they're talking, maybe they like tell realize. themselves. Yeah, they realize it. So. Well, also because we live in this era now, like Bill was saying, like, you know, he's got his statistics. I got my statistics. He's got yeah. his articles. I got my articles. And we go through it all until one of us gets affected. And again, this goes back to what, here's, here's another great example. Great article. And for me, it's kind of like, I kind of want to laugh, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's sad. But, there was an article about some lady who's married to some Mexican dude or something, and he was, you know, he's been in he's been in America for like 30, 40 years. She voted for Trump, and then come to find out that this guy never got a citizenship. So now they're deporting the husband, and they got a life together, and they got yeah. kids. Wow. And I go, well, there you go. I go, you because a lot of people that I know, because in our community, in the Iranian community, there's a lot of people that like Trump. I know a lot of people who were like, oh, he's going to be strong and this and that, whatever. Did you say that somebody gave you a bad time because you made a lot of tr- uh, Trump jokes? Yeah. I get it all the time. Yeah, I get it all the Iranians. time. Iranians. I get Iranians. Yeah. Uh, I, in the show, I talk about a Lebanese guy that got upset. Yeah. But yeah, I've had Iranians too. Right. But I uh, I thought it was the most popular thing to joke about, Trump. It is, but they don't get it because they think, because they think, the Iranians think Trump is going to get rid of the mullahs somehow. I don't know how, and then they they and if I say, oh, I don't like Trump, they go, well, then you're supporting the mullahs. But I, mm-hmm. I left the country because of the mullahs. I can't go back because of the mullahs. So I obviously, and I'm critical of the mullahs if I have to be. Yeah. Went, but but um, yeah, it's uh. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. The, the interesting thing is why I ask you if you were back to Virginia is because uh, um, I, it feels really weird to have a president for like how many people are you 250 million 300 mm-hmm. million yeah, I think, yeah. and you're basically not so much in the middle parts of america right yeah live in la uh, and california yeah, yeah. And you yeah. tour yeah. around and you see mostly the same same parts you joked a little bit about amsterdam today and Nor- norway and and different parts of Nor- uh, europe I know nothing about Amsterdam and Holland, and it's mm. really close, and we're not that that far uh, yeah. apart. But still, we're really culturally, uh, you know, really wi- widely apart. Yeah. yeah, and you have one ruler for like 350 million. It's it's not it's too so much. I agree. It's weird. California it should. Weird? I think California should secede and yeah. be its own country. I mean, it was like a fourth of the GDP. It'd be great if California and New York just became their own place, and then <laughs> everyone else can just. I mean, yeah. you're more liberal than Sweden, basically in some some ways yeah um, oh, yeah and uh, yeah and virginia basically not right no, I, 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 well virginia look th- there's a transgender person 
in the state legislature in Virginia, right? Or in the uh, something like that. And then, uh, yeah, the, Virginia is actually, uh, I think there's a lot more progressive thought in America in general. And I, I do a lot of like, I do like Reno and Vegas and stuff like that. And that's kind of like the melting pot of like a lot of, a lot of the white <laughs> trash in America. And, uh, and I was always one of these guys who are like, hey, if, if you're a Republican, you're evil. And then the, the older I got, the more I got to know my dad, who's like Fox, Fox News 24-7. I was like, what's this about? And my dad's probably the best human being I've ever known in my life. So I go, okay, there's, some, there's something here. Like, is he, is he just completely misinformed? So I just started really kind of trying to say, let me look at everything that's going on. Let me look at, and, and I think it's just gray. And I feel that if I say it's gray, the liberal liberals look at me like I'm saying I want to wear a Hitler mustache and go marching through France, which which drives me. If I say anything that's center, they tell me that I'm a Republican or I'm a Nazi or I'm evil, like unfriend me if I say anything. So that that's where it kind of bums me out because I kind of feel like, well, liberals, we're supposed to be the ones that are more emotionally complex and we can we can solve complex problems. The Republicans are like all right angles and like, yes, no, yes, no. And right. and I feel like it's almost been inverted now where the liberals are like, you have to be this way, you can't be this way, you have to believe this, you can't believe I that. Think, I think you're, you're running into a lot of people that are very extreme with that because I think for the most part, most people are- White women in LA. Yeah. White women in LA. <laughs> you, you have an issue with white women in LA. But yeah, for sure. With the all vegans. this stuff, I think, right. I think it doesn't, um, I think you can see, it is, everything is gray until something happens to you or someone you love yeah. and you go, wow, I'm very black and white about that. Yeah. So like the travel ban, I'll go back to that real quickly. Yeah. When that happened and I got all these people hitting me up going, oh my God, I'm being separated by this, that, the other. I went to a protest and there was all these people protesting and I thought, oh my God, the country has come together to protest what is obviously a an, an injustice. Which is kind of great too. Well, and then I went home that night and I was listening to the radio and they go, a uh, majority of people uh, support the travel ban. And I realized, oh my God, uh -huh. a majority of people are doing what you just said. They're living their lives. They're going to work. They feel like their jobs are fine, this, that, the other. They don't know people specifically yeah. affected by this. So it doesn't affect them. It's the same way how when I see a Black Lives Matter march, I feel like, oh, black people got it. I don't need to worry about it. But then if you go into the community and talk to somebody who's lost their kid or whatever it is, they're going to be like, no, this is a black and white issue for me and, and I need to you know, go after making yeah. this an issue. So the same way where it was an eye opener for me when the travel mm -hmm. ban happened because, because I was hearing people quote what, they, what Trump had said. He said, this is making America safer by keeping terrorists out of this country. And then you go, well, the logic is none of these countries on the travel ban have ever committed an act of terror in America. But people go, well, that doesn't mean they're not going to, and that doesn't mm -hmm. mean, and you go, really, that's how we're gonna do this? Yeah. So it doesn't, it's gray until yeah. something happens, and you go, like, if you have a buddy of yours, let's say, and for whatever reason, if some sort of discrimination happens, or let's say you get married to, to a Latina, yeah. and they kick her out, you're gonna be like, holy yeah. shit. Well, I have a, an interesting sort of flip side of that, too, is I have a friend who was falsely accused of sexual assault. And um, I can't defend that guy. I know, it's, I know it's a lie. I know it didn't happen. And I can't defend him. I can't get on Twitter and defend it or publicly defend it because that's like, I'm crucifying myself. You know what I mean? So, so that has affected me. And, I, and it, it, it pisses me off that, that stuff like that happens and it completely is underreported and no one wants to talk about it because it goes against a, a liberal agenda, which I believe in. I believe in the liberal agenda, but then when I hear things like believe all women, I kind of go, we can't be believe all anything. That's, that's dangerous. And if the liberal movement, the progressive movement is like believe all blank, bl believe all immigrants are, all Mexicans are, are good God-fearing family people that's what they all are, then then we have a problem in the other direction too. Because obviously most of the people coming to this country are, are, are good people, but are there MS-13 people? Yeah, but if you say there are MS-13 that are coming in that are running drugs and killing people, and their motto is rape, kidnap, rape, kidnap, kill, that is literally their motto. And if you say that, then all of a sudden you look like you're wearing a, 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 a have a funny haircut and you have a short mustache. The MS-13 thing is funny because it's the gang there in, in America, and it is it's a real gang and all that stuff. But it's funny to me because you're talking about the uh, Mexican. Yeah. It's, right? it's a Salvadorian. It's a Salvadorian. I think it's in a Salvadorian. Oh, Salvadorian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I they, they, that here's my point exactly is a lot of people had not heard about MS-13. I don't think Donald Trump had. I think he heard about it. 
And it's like, again, it's like the boogeyman <laughs> now. Because the fact is, yes, they exist. I used to own MS-13. He well, yeah, really that, he used guy. to think it was a Mercedes. Until oh, yeah, you, that great. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, that's all boogeyman shit, too. I mean, it's yeah. real, yeah. but it's, you know. Until it affects you. It's until boogeyman it stuff you. until yeah, it affects exactly. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, and it's amazing seeing you two guys yeah. being on the road and being a bit apart in in politics, uh, basically. And and I I don't really I, I'm thinking out loud now, thinking if it, that would be possible in Sweden. We have like the Swedish Democrats, basically. That is that would be the closest thing to Trump, maybe. Uh, and uh, then we have the Social Democrats and having two two guys going on the road and being for those different parties. But by the I, way, I couldn't I'm, see that. I'm 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 donating tons of money to whatever Democrat candidate there is in 2020. I, I, There's I, zero yeah. chance I'll ever support Trump. You're you know what I mean? Super brave, even 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 trying to defend something around Trump that's, in but that's, Sweden. But that's, so that's crazy, super brave. though, right? Yeah. Isn't that a little bit crazy that you can't say anything? You can't say anything. Like if it I is. go, I think it if, is. If yeah. They go if a kid's no. 12 years old no. and and wants to be a, a a boy, you as a parent need even hormone treatments. If I go, I wouldn't do that as a parent. Then all of a sudden, I'm a fascist asshole, which is crazy to me. It's just a little bit crazy. That's all. I just think there's a little bit of craziness going on. And if it if it's Trump's fault, I don't know. But well, like I, I'm not going to go after like, oh liberals. I hate liberals and da da da. So I make it about a vegan, a specific vegan. <laughs> I'm on you with that. And one. I just, I just kind of love <laughs> everything that I hate about what's going on with entitled white women liberals, <laughs> right. and I put into this vegan. Can we? Uh, we, we it's late, and you yeah, want to go to sleep. Up. Yeah, yeah. I'm about to fall asleep. And uh, <laughs> just uh, the last part. How how are your routines now that you're on on uh, on this road? Uh, like <laughs> oh, our hours routine. I see. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think we're both jet lagged. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I usually wake up way too early, and then. I end up napping before the show. So my hours are still LA time, but I'm going to fall asleep like pretty soon. <laughs> and then I'll wake up at five in the morning. So if you want to continue this at five in the morning, we do. <laughs> yeah, let's continue. Yeah, yeah. No, it's ex- that part of it is, is very tiring, especially with the jet lag. If this were all happening in California, it might be a little more manageable because you'd be on the Cali time. Yeah, yeah. right. Hey guys, it has been really, really fun, and uh, I really enjoy it, and I really enjoy the political stuff as well. And, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting to hear how how life is in in uh, in real life in in the states. And uh, you can uh, follow Maz on Maz Jobrani. Yeah, it's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. It's at Maz Jobrani. M A Z J O B R A N I. And I just started my own podcast called uh, Back to School with Maz Jobrani. So find that on iTunes. Subscribe. Check it out. And Bill. Oh, yeah, that's good that you said that. I, I have a podcast, too, called The After Laugh, where I interview comics in, uh, in L.A., usually after sets at the Laugh Factory. So that's also on, on iTunes. And I'm at Bill Dawes. And uh, don't come with protest signs if you come on the show. Sorry, <laughs> what All right. <laughs> and your uh, podcast is about your interviewing comedians. I was interviewing, yeah. But actually, as a matter of fact, I just interviewed uh, the one that just came out today was Amir K. and, and Nimer. Oh, that's cool. Their right. interview came out today, yeah. Right. So, And your podcast, going, what is going to... Just started be? today. It what? actually premiered today. All right. Back to School with Maz Jobrani. I interview uh, professors, writers, people that are experts, and they teach us stuff while uh, we make it funny. The first one is with Reza Aslan, oh. and we discuss oh. God. All right. <laughs> out the gate. <laughs> Great. All right, guys. Hey, guys. Thank you very much. Thank Let's you. close this up. Bye. Yes, that was Maz Jobrani and Bill Dawes. And uh, thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please go in and subscribe. And if you really, really, really like this podcast, please give us five stars in the Podcaster app. If you super, super like us, please leave a, 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 a nice comment as well. And my name is Tamas Kafari. Thank you again for listening. Until next week. Ciao.